Turundusradio. Hello dear listeners and welcome to our Marketing Radio talk show number 144. I am Anu Malnoritz from Marketing Institute in Estonia and I'm going to be your host today. And my guest via Skype is Dr. Nikolaus Dimitriadis, who is Development Director in um, Executive Development Institute at uh, the University of Sheffield in the National Faculty and City College. So, hi Nikolaus. Hello, so nice to be with you. Today we are going to talk about the neuroscience-based communication. Uh, to introduce the topic, I would like to say that uh, we have discussed in our marketing radio talk shows about neuromarketing before. But today we will focus more about how to use the neuroscience in communications. And to start with, Nikolaus, I would like to ask, why should we use neurosciences in marketing and communications at all? This is a, a great question, and I think the, the right first question of the day. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think we have to go a little bit uh, further back in time and see a, a very strange model of understanding humanity that came about around the 18th century. So 18th century economists, very famous economists now, and many of them from Scotland, um, started developing their first um, ideas of um, how people and companies behave in markets. Uh, the basis for modern economics actually were um, created then. And this specific model, um, in a very different world from the world we live today, uh, you can imagine. Um, yeah, absolutely, it, sound, <laughs> it right. sounds very interesting. Yeah, it, it is a completely different world. It's, it's, it's a world where if, if you want to buy bread, you buy from the local, in, in a village or a town that you live, from a local um, uh, a bread uh, shop. Or, or if you want bakery, if you want to buy meat, you go to the meat place. And, and, and you know everybody by name. Um, the information is very limited. Um, you don't know much what's happening around the world. You don't know much what's happening from in the other village next to you, to be honest. And um, um, the economy... This era thought that uh, decision-making is very straightforward. Uh, human beings, uh, mainly um, motivated by self-interest, um, they try to maximize the utility from any transaction that they make. So they have some kind of constant cost-benefit analysis in their head. And uh, the outcome of this cost-benefit analysis is to minimize cost and uh, maximize profits and uh, if people behaved different if for example somebody was emotional or irrational it was a bad thing actually economists have, have a, a very interesting names that they call to people that are behaving irrationally or or emotionally i, I don't know if you've heard about the term animal spirits actually yeah. there is this term in, in economics where um, uh, some economists actually claim that whenever humans do not behave in the model that i just be, described we are kind of possessed by animal spirits. You know, the, the animal primal part of ourselves takes over and uh, it's like zombies, we become non-rational beings. And, and th this, this is a, a, a model of, of looking at humans that we now call homo economicus, the homo economicus model of, of uh, viewing humanity, which uh, not only was never scientifically proven, we never had any serious... Uh, science backing uh, the the homo economicus model, and uh, now that we have, uh, mainly through neuroscience, we understand that it was not only a wrong model, but it is a dangerous model. It's it's really dangerous to look at human beings as uh, as rational beings. We have we have a rational capacity. That's a different thing. We have the capacity to think rational, but this does not make us a rational beings. So the contrary, we now know through neuroscience, that we are emotional beings that sometimes think. We are not rational beings that sometimes have emotions. Um, and for me, the exciting thing about, about neuroscience, and not only neuroscience, I would like to open a little bit our discussion. Neuroscience is one way of looking into the brain, the most direct and most wonderful way, but, but we also have behavioral economics, uh, psychology and sociology that through behavioral experiments we can indirect see what happens in the brain 
And this, this, this uh, new model of looking humanity, replacing the homo economicus model, brings drastical, dramatic changes in all aspects of humanity. For me, teaching and education has to change drastically, and it is, slowly but steadily. Because, I mean, if, if you really think about it, we tried to, for 300 years, we tried to educate our kids to become homo economicus, something that we are not. We know we are not. Um, in, uh, in, um, in policy and uh, in, in, in economic policy, in finance policy, financial policy, in management, of course, we, we treat employees with carrots and sticks, like they're, they're homo economicus. And of course, uh, with consumers as well and our customers. We need to replace the basic model of customer behavior. And neuroscience and other behavioral sciences help us doing so. Wow. What a long explanation, <laughs> starting from several centuries ago yeah. and then reaching yeah. today. Uh, so tell me, what are the success stories of neurosciences that, that, that has been used in communications and really using different methods of motivation or analyzing bio behavior, uh, right. Right. like using uh, the current methods? Correct. So um, there are two ways to see neuromarketing. Now, neuromarketing... Um, it's a term that not everybody likes. I have to tell you that parts of the world where when you say, I mean, neuromarketing, they are quite negative uh, because uh, unfortunately, uh, for some people, neuromarketing means manipulation, which of course we can discuss later on and see why I believe it's not the case. Okay. So uh, some people call it neuromarketing. There is a new term now coming about consumer neuroscience or customer neuroscience, which I think is also a very, very interesting term. There are two ways to see this um, new way of, of doing marketing. Uh, the one way, let's call it the, the limited or the narrow way, is to, do it, to see it as purely research. So replacing, let's say, or accompanying focus groups, surveys, any other type of online social media research we might be doing. And you add neuromarketing as a, a, a different uh, branch of marketing research. So that, that's, that's the way I think that unfortunately many people see neuromarketing. For me, it is, of course, a new way of doing research, but it's wider. I think that neuromarketing can impact not only how we can... Um, um, present our customers with uh, with some options or with some stimuli and then see how the brain reacts and based on this reaction to predict how they will behave in the market. That's wonderful and beautiful and uh, we do it quite a lot all around the world. But there is a, a, the, the wider view. Um, neuromarketing as a new marketing paradigm, as, as a marketing paradigm that uh, replaces the the basics of marketing of the past. So not just the research, but what we call now applied neuromarketing, which is using neuromarketing principles to design strategy, to design channels, to, to change the very structure of our marketing team in companies. Can you believe? We take neuro, ne neuroscience, see how the brain is organized, and we try to project this within our, our marketing department. So I, I'm the follower of this wider view of neuromarketing. But this automatically means that I'm also following and I, I support the research one. Okay. So concerning um, concerning successes, in, in research, there are many successes um, and uh, widely publicized. Uh, it's very easy for your listeners to, to Google the this very famous ad by Volkswagen, The Force, it is one of the most successful ads in the car industry um, a few years ago where the kid is dressed like Darth Vader. I don't know if you have watched this very famous ad. And he's trying to move items around with his force. Of course, he cannot do it. But when his father brings back the car, a Volkswagen, um, the, the, the child runs out and tries on the car his force. You know, he tries to activate the car. And the father from the kitchen, he presses the button on his key and the car starts and the, and the kid is so amazed that the force worked. So this study, <laughs> this, yeah, it's, it's an amazing and very successful actually for, for Volkswagen. So the, this study um, is also exists on, on YouTube. People will search it and they will see the, the neuro research on it. You can see second by second um, how the brain engages um, with the story and uh, which parts of the brain are activating in second by second in the story. 
and you will see there clearly that there are some points where the brain is very engaged, attention is very high, emotional engagement is positive, and there are other, other parts of the story where engagement is not so high or that the emotion is sinking. So I, I think that, um, that uh, and I, I can share personal stories from my own research, research, of course, with you and your listeners, but for me, neuromarketing research comes, comes to provide um, um, actual scientific evidence in research and in marketing communications. Before, you had the creative department, um, creative uh, director of an advertising agency, copywriters, um, designers, being the, the, the absolute holders of creative output. So if they said that uh, uh, design techniques or principles had to be applied, you as a client or as an account manager in this, you had to comply and say, yes, that's yeah. your profession. You know? and so if Absolutely. you like something, if you do it something. And then, of course, we, we ask people, did you like it or not? This was not a scientific process. This was a very, how can I say... I would say more folklore kind of of doing business. Um, and you know what? I think that because marketing communications did not have a scientific way to to develop or to or to test, uh, marketing departments never had um, status in companies. In two thousand and twelve, there was a study in the UK that found out that eighty uh, percent of the um, sampled CEOs did not believe in the work of the marketing department and they were not at all impressed by it. 80%. This is embarrassing for marketing. While the same CEOs from this study found that 91% of them appreciated the work of CFOs and CTOs. Now, for me, we cannot always marketeers, we cannot always blame the other departments. They don't understand what we're doing. We deal with human. Now, that's not enough. This is not good line of defense. We have to bring science back to marketing and to prove that it's working. Uh, there is this very uh, this guy from uh, the, the, the 19th century um, that he said, one of the pioneers in advertising, um, Whitemaker, Whitemaker, if I remember correctly, 19th century, so he said 1850s, he said 50% of the money I spent in advertising is wasted. I just don't know which 50%. Because we never worked which part of our communications worked or, or we did, never knew which part of the communications worked or not. It was kind of touch and feel. It was kind of, we call it art of communications, which sounds nice and sexy, but in corporate terms and the return on investment and uh, you know huge budgets does not sound good. It's not the award we will win in, in Lion in Cannes that will make us our campaign great. It has to be other stuff. So I think that bringing the science back to marketing, it will not be a, a you know a touch and feel. Yes, I like it. I don't like it. But I, I will research exactly what is happening in the brain of my customers while they are exposed to my communications. Brings more credibility. I, I don't say 100% credibility. There are other things to discuss, but it definitely improves credibility. This yeah. is why, in my experience, many advertising agencies dislike neuromarketing. The people that have the most resistance to change for neuromarketing are not usually marketing directors or the client side. They are creative directors. There are um, art directors, designers, and copywriters in agencies that unfortunately were not educated and trained on neuromarketing. They were in uh, some uh, graphic design school or any other of the, of, the, of the creative arts universities, and they never talk about neuroscience. Absolutely. So for them, it's very difficult to accept that somebody, you know, a machine, an EEG, you know, the, a helmet that I put on, on my on my customer's head when I show them some creative, that this will say more than their understanding of creative uh, design. So, so you mean that currently, today, every marketing organization should have designs tested by neuromarketers and neuroscience people telling what works and what not? Exactly. You know, when, when it's my, my, my favorite moment, um, from the many technologies and the methods in um, neuromarketing research is also, and I'm, I'm sure that both you and your, and your listeners know about this, eye tracking. Now, yeah. the, the eye is the, is the mirror of the soul. You know, there's, there's, 
it, it, it's not by accident that, for example, um, um, uh, Simon, uh, um, Simon Baron Cohen, a very famous neuroscientist, by the way, the brother of, of uh, the actor that played Borat, you, you know Borat, the movie? Yeah, we know, of course. Yes, Sasha Baron Cohen. So his brother, Simon Baron Cohen, he's a very famous neuroscientist. And uh, he, he has developed a very famous technique. You can find it also online where um, you see eyes, or deep eyes of people, but just the eyes. And uh, he provides you with four answers, you know, four, four possible emotions. And you have to choose one of the four emotions. What do you think that this person experiences only by looking at their eyes? Because their, their eyes, the, our eyes is a, is a point of fixation for our brain. We now know that uh, when we walk on the street, when we are in the office, uh, the, the, the place where our eyes will fixate is somebody else's eyes. Eyes say a lot for neuromarketing. Okay, so we, we do a lot of eye tracking. Because eye tracking can show attention, focus, even emotion. So my favorite moment when we do eye tracking studies is something that's called heat, heat map. So heat map is nothing, nothing but your, let's say, uh, Facebook front page or a billboard or um, a brochure. Uh, and then people are exposed in this, and uh, for a few seconds we allow them to look at it. And then through infrared um, reader, we, we know where the eyes were falling, moving around, etc. So the places where the eyes were fixating, we call them heat maps, and we present them with um, a little bit um, a, a reddish color. That, and we say to a client, look, you know, this is where your clients are looking at. But the best thing... Animal is the opposite. It's the fog map. It's when you show them what they didn't see, not what they saw. So we actually, with the fog map, is like the negative of the heat map, where we 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 mask, like with the fog, the places where the eyes didn't go. And this is the moment of truth. This is where clients are looking at their communications. You know, brands are looking at their communications. This sometimes very expensive or very time consuming because you know there is first the agency makes some uh, uh, versions and then they send you the versions then you decide then back and forth and changes and then you see that most of it actually will never be visible yeah and especially your product and, exactly. in the wrong place <laughs> well, uh, that no one uh, sees looks a completely different kind of <laughs> nice eyes or something <laughs> exactly and, and this is my favorite because they look at it and they say oh but where is the message? <laughs> and, and then and then we start the conversation like, if you see an ad, even you, you can t- see do it even with videos. The, the if you if you can say, by looking at a fog map, not a heat map, a fog map, if you can say what the ad is talking about and which is the brand, it's okay. But if you look at the the ad with a fog map and you cannot make heads from tails, then we have to go back. So when I show this to my to, to my other partners, clients, or my own organization, I tell them, how did we ever create communications before? How did we ever, we're so confident that any type of creative output was effective or not without such kind of tools now? Actually, it's impossible. So it's a change of paradigm. It's not just improving. It's, it's changing completely the way. Because then it has to go backwards. Creative departments have to understand what make their elements appear in a fog map or not. What makes a number, a logo, a story, a, a graphic element stand out to the human eye or not? Okay, and, and this is where we don't ask people. You don't ask your clients what you can see because the, the eye movement, most of it, as well as our total human experience, is subconscious. So, of course, we can always explain, but we will not make it 
for what actually is. Absolutely. So can you suggest what would what would be would be better process wise? Is it so yes. that the designer does the just the first sketches, you show them to the customer, then you get the first understanding about what is seen and what is hidden, and then you go back to the designer and let to polish the designs and check it again? Or is it enough if the designer does a couple of versions and you choose the best one at the end? Right. Both of these processes are great, and it's may, what many um, neuroscientists, because now, now we live in very interesting times, you know, the best uh, marketing researchers are now neuro, neuroscientists. So many neuroscientists now go into, into marketing, which is tricky because they don't fully understand what marketing is. Um, so they would tell you exactly, exactly similar things like, okay, so neuromarketing is not here to help you create an ad, it's here to help you test an ad. But I think that it can help you even create the ad in the very beginning. So um, you remember I mentioned that you can see neuromarketing in two perspectives, as research or as a new way of doing marketing. Mm -hmm. If we train our creative departments and, of course, the account people and the client side in neuromarketing or consumer or customer neuromarketing principles, then we save time. Because the truth is that um, although neuromarketing is very new and neuroscience itself is very new, eh, there are people that claim that 90% of the things we know about the brain are less than 20 years old. Now, th now this, this is mind blow. It's a very new science because of the technology. So 90% of the things we know about the brain, they're just 20 years old. It's a very new science. But still, still, we have principles. There are constant um, new studies that come out that show how the brain likes to receive information. And this is the key point, I think, in our conversation. In the previous human model, the Homo economicus, we were not presenting information to people in the way that it was brain friendly, in the way that the brain has been evolved to accept and use. On, other, on the contrary, it was a romantic, I would say a religious kind of dogma of how our brain should work to make us home economicus. And then we were trying to feed, I would say force feed the information in that way. So now that we, we more and more reveal how the brain likes, lo the brain loves to receive information in some specific way. Why? Because the brain is the most energy devouring organ we have. Now, the brain is only 2% of our body, only 2% of our body mass, but consumes 20% of our energy. Now, that's crazy. So, only 2% of the body spends 20% of the total energy that the body has. This means that the, the brain's main role is to save energy. Because what the brain wants to do is to keep us alive. So most of the brain energy goes to regulate my heartbeat, my uh, body temperature, to coordinate my organs, my movement. This is, you know how much of the energy of the brain, so 20% of the total energy goes to the brain. From this 20%, how much goes for the non-conscious tasks? More than 90%. So actually, <laughs> only 10% and some, some scientists go and say 5% of the total energy that goes into the brain goes to actually conscious experience, replying and all this that homo economicus or economists saw that homo economicus is all about. So a lot of communications that we create ask for the brain to spend unnecessary energy and the brain doesn't want to do this. It wants to do that under one condition, that we are passionate about something. If we are passionate about something, we, devo we, we devote more brain energy to this thing. But usually it's not the, 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 the case with our brains. So we need to create all our communications based on brain principles that make it easy, direct, um, and, and deeper, I would say, for the brain. Okay, this, is, this, is, this is what I think that we should actually educate the whole marketing ecosystem.
who is involved in marketing, whoever is inclu included in the wider marketing function from PR and communications people to sustainability people to market to to technology people now CTOs because we do a lot of with big data now and, and um, uh, social intelligence you know and data intelligence we have to educate all these people inside the company and outside the companies market research agencies um, um, uh, uh, the uh, PR agencies um, creative agencies BTL agencies. Uh, digital agencies, community management agencies. We use now, you know, hundreds of agencies. Every big brand has so many different agencies. They all need to understand the brain-friendly uh, principles, communication principles. Then we will save time, and then we can test. Okay, still we need to test. Absolutely. Um, can you tell me um, what type of organizations could benefit most from the from the neurosciences? Because my my question is based on um, we here in Estonia have an understanding that all kind of testing and neuro testing is very expensive. So the small companies mostly cannot afford it. It's only for the big ones. And maybe there are some areas you can benefit most, like in stores, whether um, really the in-store communication right. and in-store behavior is so important um, right. in your final final sales uh, revenue, what you receive every day. So so. You see that, okay, maybe these are the hotspots where you should use more of the testing and the other parts, okay, right. let it go like the old methods, maybe it wasn't too wrong. Okay, Gr great question and I'm very happy you asked me this because it's the right time to, to burst this uh, myth as well. First of all, the, the applied neuromarketing principles, the principles that help you develop any kind of message in a more brain-friendly uh, style should be taught to everybody. Uh, there are on, there are many nice speeches online. Please, you can watch also my TED speech about brain brain friendly communications. If you Google Dimitriadis and TEDx, you will find it. There are many other people talking about this. There are many books about it. You know, so there is a lot of people. There are training courses about it. So everybody, any type of company, from uh, from a political party to a, a small a small. Uh, shop in the corner to the big brands to everybody should know because we are talking about actually a new way of looking at humanity so even 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 kids at school should be educated about this we will have a much better society now when it comes to testing though to the technology that you asked me the prices are so unbelievably um, uh, affordable now that i think that there is no excuse because i can find it if you you know what if you are exposed to what some neuro testing can do for your brands, if you see how much money you were wasting in communications that you thought that they were so cool and fantastic, it's 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 no way back. So let me let me tell you some uh, costs to I hope convince your listeners that uh, they should all do it. For example, I mentioned the fog maps and the heat maps, right? Yeah. Now. Uh, you can do predictive test. Predictive test means you don't need to have the technology of eye tracking yourself. There are websites where you submit, you upload your um, uh, web pages, your, um, your brochures, any type of creative work. And it, based on what we know in neuroscience up to now concerning um, eye tracking, it gives you back as a result, as a result, the heat map and the fog map for seven dollars. Wow! Per item. And uh, okay, it's it's predictive. Uh, this is called predictive neuroscience, and it has an accuracy rate of around seventy percent. But seventy percent is fantastic. Uh, for the first five seconds, where the eye will go. Uh, more than that, we need to do the actual eye tracking. For, but for the first five seconds, has more than seventy percent accuracy rate for seven dollars. So. There is no excuse. There is no excuse. Anything we do, we don't just upload it. And you know what? Maybe it's it's a, it's another type of information. Maybe we will use it 100%. Maybe we'll use it 50%. But there is no excuse not doing it. Now, let's say that you want to do eye tracking yourself. There are solutions, very famous and popular from iTribe, where you buy the the bar to do eye tracking for $100. There is no... So $100 for $110. 
it's really a, 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 and then you connect and you use the software on the cloud. So really, you just get this this uh, um, stick. It's it's like a small bar that you place in front of your laptop. It's it's extremely cheap and affordable. So I, I, it, it's an ex- now let's go to more advanced technologies. Let's go to EEG. EEG is when we place the electrodes in 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 a form of a helmet on our head, and we can. Uh, for neuromarketing uh, uh, research, we can do two things: to check emotional engagement. You know, if somebody is emotionally engaged, and if this engagement is positive or negative, so we check: are you emotionally engaged or uh, passive? And then we say: is this emotional engagement positive or negative? And then we can also check also cognitive engagement. So, is somebody's pays attention, is some information difficult for your brain, you know, it spends more energy than it should. I will tell you about a test we did with an Italian neuroscientist, a partner from mine, a few, few weeks ago. So EEG it is, has become now a major element of neuromarketing research. Yes, good EEG, the one that ch- checks many channels, um, more than 20 channels, and it goes up to 30 channels, can be expensive to buy. It can be something like... 8,000, 7, 8,000 euros. However, there are much cheaper options for $700, even for $400 with fewer channels that you just connect on your laptop with a, a Bluetooth stick and you can use it. Now, it's not as accurate, but it's okay. I've used it and it, it brings very nice results. So concerning eye tracking, it's extremely affordable. Concerning EEG, Good EG, medical EG is still expensive. I think it's more for a for a research agency to buy. But non-medical EG, it's very affordable. And the third technique that we're using, which is uh, emotional uh, facial recognition, which is um, we um, we tape the facial expressions of people while they're looking on something, while they're reading or viewing something. Uh, this unfortunately also now is um, is rather expensive because you have to license the software online. There is no free software that I, I recommend the free sampling software where everybody should try you know, and see if it is for them. Just to finish this part about costs, um, there is uh, me and this Italian uh, uh, business partner, this neuroscientist that I do a lot of work with. Uh, we have recommended to companies, big brands, uh, Italian brands, Swedish brands, um, to create their own neural lab in their companies. Companies like Hewlett and Packard have done it already, already in the US. With a cost which is less than 15,000 euros, less than 15,000 euros, any big brand can create its own neural lab inside their premises and test everything daily they can test different prices different um, websites different uh, creatives everything and for bigger brands okay not the smaller you know not the smes but for big you know how much big brands are spending for uh, research Fifteen thousand for them is you know a few days of, of uh, research project to create their own neural lab i think is a, it's a great um, proposal and we have heard uh, very positive views for big big brands on that Tell me now, if I'm, uh, let's say, a chain of stores here in Estonia, yes. let's say yes. I have 30 stores, Right. maybe maybe it's even not the supermarket, but let's say some kind of shoes and apparel and some right. kind right. of things. Okay. So yep. what should be the tools or how should I use neuromarketing in the best way in my business? Right. Let's start from the very beginning. First of all, you should train your salespeople to how the brain works. When people come in the store, uh, human touch is still the most important. You know, we talk a lot about digital technologies and everything, but still human touch. This is why Zappos, you know, the big retailer, online retailer in the in the U.S., um, only five percent of their um, sales is through their call center, but they spend more money in the call center than they spend in any other because they have found that that at least once their customers will call their call centers and this call will be the biggest uh, um, the, the biggest motivator for loyalty. So human touch is very important. We have to train our salespeople, our store managers, our call centers in brain-friendly communication techniques, 
it's not difficult. This is what I've been doing the last five years of my life. It's 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 not difficult. You can really train your yourself to talk and to ask in brain friendly ways, and it can really engage your customers. Now, not only people, we can create a shopping experience which is brain friendly. What does it mean? Signage has to be very clear. It has to follow the customer journey, the logical and the emotional um, customer journey in the shop. It should make the life of buyers easy, fast, easy, with shortcuts and with as much engagement as possible. Packaging. We, we did also a study about packaging with a shoe company from Italy. How the, the, the box of the, of the shoe box itself should be signed uh, with the signage, with the colors, and everything else. Um, also, your online, your online um, presentation. Everything that I see on your online uh, website, I don't know if you have e-commerce, should be also optimized for the brain. Okay. So what I, what actually we should do is take a business, break down the business in all the the customer journey touch points, and see how each one can be optimized by using a brain friendly approach. But it has to be a top down revolution. First, the management of the of the chain has to be exposed to brain friendly marketing. They have to be uh, trained on it. They have to be compassionate on it. And I can assure you that it, it always happens. They always become passionate on it. And then to roll it down to all the customer journey touch points. Salespeople, uh, shop experience. Okay, we have now technology, for example, and this is very known. You, we wear some specially designed glasses for people that come into the store, and we can check 